and welcome to another episode of Chapters here on Armstrong Television. Chapters is the television show that profiles authors, editors, and publishers in West Virginia, Ohio, and Kentucky. I'm Elliot Parker, and it's great to have you with us. We are delighted to have Red Dawson with us here today to talk to us about his new book, A Coach in Progress, Martial Football, A Story of Survival and Revival. And Red Dawson was a standout offensive and defensive end at Florida State. He was enshrined in the Florida State University Hall of Fame in 1993. He was selected in both the NFL and the AFL drafts, and he was a member of professional teams in the NFL, the Canadian Football League, and the Continental Football League. He became an assistant coach at Marshall University in 1968, and after his coaching career ended in the early 1970s, Red worked in construction, eventually opening and operating Red Dawson Construction Company in Huntington for decades. He's now retired, and he enjoys spending time speaking, giving public speeches, and painting distinguished works of art. We're delighted to have him here to talk to us about his great book. Uh, and his experiences uh, at Marshall and uh, his book, A Coach in Progress. So, Red, welcome to Chapters. It's nice to have you here. Thank you for having me. I wanted to ask you, uh, a lot of us uh, have heard of your name and are familiar of you, uh, familiar with you uh, from being a part uh, of Marshall in the late 60s and early 70s, but, but you had a career, as we mentioned, uh, in college and, and some professional leagues. Tell us a little bit about that, uh, about your career at Florida State and the NFL and and, and how you got drafted and where you went and what you experienced. Uh, Perry Moss, who uh, uh, I came up to Marshall with on his staff in uh, 1968, previously had been the head coach at Florida State and had recruited me to Florida State to play football. And I played, it was five years down there, one year was a red shirt year. And I got drafted as uh, in my junior year with the Los Angeles Rams and the Boston Patriots. Still got a Boston Patriot t-shirt too. Not <laughs> not New England Patriot. Yeah. <laughs> um, anyway, it's just been a it's been a long grind. Um, I played a little bit of pro football and then came up here and coached for a little bit and um, then the next thing I know, it's uh, all the football's behind me. Mm -hmm. And I'm working I was working uh, as a laborer really for a for for a friend of mine and um, kept going from there. Um, I felt like I was learning the business and, uh, and a, a year or two later I um, started my own company and, and uh, I can't tell you that it was the most uh, successful company but it sure fit my needs at the time. So um, I've got, I live out on a hill just outside of town on 5th Street Road and um, and uh, ready for retirement. Great, fantastic. Yeah, I didn't have, I went down to pick up my, uh, my the mail at my box down on the road. That's the only time I've been out of, out of the house since I came, you know, till I came down here. So, so enjoy, enjoying yeah. retirement, it sounds yeah, like. Yeah, I'm enjoying retirement, and I sure don't enjoy the cold weather. Yeah, absolutely. I, mm -hmm. I, I, I second you there, that's for sure. Um, so you came to Marshall in 1968, as you mentioned, uh, as an assistant coach. Um, what, what attracted you to this job? Sort of what brought you here? And when you first got here, what, what were some of your duties as the assistant coach? Well, I was, uh, I think I was coaching um, when I first came here. I think I was coaching over on the defense, defensive backs. Um, and uh, I was just looking for a job. Mm -hmm. I wanted to, some kind of way to make a living. And so when we got up here, we, we, uh, I think we, um, no, we didn't win a game that first year, but things were falling into shape for us a little bit. And then uh, again, we had a, a bad year in 71. We, um, we didn't do very good either. Uh, right at, that's right after the plane crash, but uh, things moved along, and I got uh, I got by all the hard times. Mm -hmm. I wanted to ask you too. You mentioned this about November fourteenth, nineteen seventy, a date that a lot of people in this community and really across the state and across the nation remember, and that's when when the, the plane that was carrying 75 members of the football team crashed uh, just short of Tri-State Airport in Huntington. The Thundering Herd mm -hmm. were coming back from a game in Greenville, North Carolina against East Carolina. Um, I, I know that you were part of a team that didn't come back on the plane. 
where were you going during that time when they were coming back from North Carolina? Um, when that weekend, we I think the we left on a. I know that I let. I left on a on a Thursday, and went down re, on a recruiting trip uh, down at Ferrum Junior College. We were after a big old boy that uh, big linebacker, and then we. Um, uh, a graduate assistant got in the Marshall University wagon and drove back with me. And the other coach flew back on the plane. It was Dick Brackett, and, you know, he perished in the plane crash. Um, and that, that was um, – I grew up a lot that night, for sure. Um, but – just it was just it was just real hard times after that. Yeah, absolutely. And and you talk a lot about you know one of the great things about your book is is we're back in time right there with you as you're going through uh, this process before the plane crash, during the plane crash, and after. Um, one of the things that you talked about uh, in the book and, and you repeated several times is that yeah, um, prior to this you'd never really been to a funeral, and all of a sudden you've got 26 or 27 that you've gone to yeah, memorial never, services. What never, was that like? Never been to a funeral. Had never seen a dead person. Um, and then, I don't know, I, uh, 27 funerals sticks in my mind. I think I went briefly at some funerals because I had to go and cover at another funeral. We took the coaches and, and Dr. Deadman and all of the administrators at, at Marshall at the time. We divided up the funerals and we all had to cover some of them. And it was devastating. It was, and uh, you know, I haven't seen the movie in a long time. It, it kind of still um, might cause me a nightmare or two, but, um, but it, it was very realistic because I'm sure that there were times when a funeral procession of the cars had to stop for another funeral, mm -hmm. you know, that was going the other way. So yeah. it, was, um, it was hard times, no doubt about it. You know, one of the things that is also interesting uh, that you touch on in your book is that, you know, a after this period, a after the funerals and, and you know, people were just beginning to sort of get over the plane crash, there still had to be things done uh, on the administrative side and the athletic side. No and, question. And there was a scene that you write about in the book, which I, I loved, when you and uh, Donald Dedman, who was the president at the time, uh, Dr. Dedman, uh, were going across campus. You were leaving Old Main to walk across Marshall's campus, for yeah. folks who are familiar with the campus, to address the 44 players who weren't on the mm -hmm. plane. And uh, Dr. Dedman looked at you and he said, what do I say? I've never addressed a football team before. Yeah, well, can you tell us? Can you tell us what that conversation you was know, like? You know, he was he was very, he was he was shaky, and and of course we all were, for different reasons I'm sure. But he didn't know what to tell the football team, so I told him. I said, "Well, uh, assure them that we're going to build the program back. You know that there's still going to be football at Marshall. They don't know, you know they, the freshman team." and the ones that didn't make the trip to East Carolina, they had no idea whether they had a scholarship. They, you know, I just didn't know. And that was what I was trying to, um, to tell Dr. Dedman, you know, assure them that they're still part of Marshall University and Marshall University is going to come back and the football team is going to come back. So that was, that's what I remember about it. Mm -hmm. And it was just one of my favorite scenes. Uh, I, I tell you what, Dr. Dedman is one of the toughest people I ever met in my life. To go through some of the things he went through after that. And I've always prided myself on being pretty tough. Mm -hmm. And the same for me, too. I can get tears in my eyes, you know, just thinking back just for a minute or five seconds on it. But it's, it, was, it was just hard times. Yeah. Absolutely. What were some of the other things that, that you and Dr. Dedman did? You, you, you talk about this a little bit in the book, too. So you go and address the team, but then there was more sort of behind-the-scenes stuff you all had to do. What, what, what else well, was going on at that time, too? Because I never – I told – I went in and talked to Dr. Dedman and just told him, I'll do anything you want me to do. But I have never been to a funeral. I've never seen a dead person. There's just no way that I can help with identifications. 
And he said, well, we won't worry about that until that time comes. And, and uh, the time came, and he came. I had a little office, a little cubby hole over in Old Main that I was working out of with the phones. And he came over there, and as soon as I finished the phone call, he said, we got to talk. And the state police had said you, they needed somebody at the doctor's, uh, needed someone out there that knew the players and the boosters. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, he didn't know any football players. Mm -hmm. You know, he didn't, he didn't know many of the town people. And I knew him very well, and I knew I had to go out there. And he says, I know you told me you weren't going to go. So I'm going to go, but the state police are on the way over here, and uh, I'm going out to the armory, and I guess that leaves you in charge of Marshall. Now, what, what am I supposed to say? <laughs> yeah. you, know, I, I, that, you know, he couldn't help anyway. Yeah. I said, no, I'm going to go. And, uh, and one thing that has kind of sticked in my crawl, sticks in my crawl still when we talk, when it when I read about it or somebody talks about it, is some of the uh, players that were freshmen and some of them that were injured talking about going out there and helping with the identification, mm -hmm. it, it just didn't happen. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, it, it, that, that kind of uh, upsets me a little bit for somebody to say something like that. You know, you can tell it. I love a good story whether it's true or false but uh, <laughs> you know you don't play with that kind of stuff yeah and um, the you know the administrators nobody would allow that yeah so 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 in 1971 there are some more changes dr Dedman leaves as president at marshall um and at one time you, you thought maybe you were going to be in the running to be the next head coach at marshall you had a lot mm -hmm. of support from people in the community people within uh, the university and outside the university uh, wh what happened dr Dedman leaves and, and you're in the running no, and then there's more changes yeah coming. i'm sure that have uh, dr Dedman leaving uh, when i don't i forget the time period there what when, when did dr Dedman leave 71 1971 1971 do you have any idea what time it was? Uh, i don't I, uh, I don't remember so. <laughs> i didn't well, write it down but well the reason it, it does it doesn't really matter but uh dr Dedman was a fine man and i really enjoyed him and knowing him and uh, you know i could uh talk on that for a long, long, long time. And if you read the book, I, I, I kept going back to the administrator. Yeah. And I've never in my life had anybody that I didn't know or I don't know what I ever did to him to offend him or anything, but he just, um, Joe McMullen just stayed on me constantly. Mm -hmm. Always was criticizing something. And um, I, I just, um, I just, I, I didn't know what to do. Yeah. I knew what was going to happen mm -hmm. if he kept on. Yeah. I was going to put, <laughs> and then I'd have been out of coaching for sure, right. forever. Right. And I wouldn't be very well thought of. But it, I had thought about that. But, but I, had, you know, there was some. As a newspaper uh, columnist that said some bad things about me, indicated maybe I was a, a mole that was trying to undermine uh, Jack Lingle's efforts. And uh, he's gone now, but he knows he knows what he did. I, we had a good talk before he passed away, and uh, he apologized. Got tears in his eyes, started crying. I said, "No, I didn't. I didn't want." I didn't want this to happen, you know. Yeah. I forgive you. Yeah. But fortunately, and I certainly didn't have any big plan or anything, but um, I had a, a good friend, I thought, uh, that had a construction company out in uh, Spring Valley area, Willis Wilson, and he told me he would give me a job as a trainee. And a trainee, I found out, is um, a laborer 
that's got a college degree. Mm -hmm. And I labored for, I don't know, three or four years and then started climbing on some heavy equipment, start, started running that, and um, shooting elevations and setting up lasers for, we, he was basically a site contractor. Mm -hmm. um, and I decided that, um, you know, the, you know, why not go for broke? I might as well get uh, uh, start my own business um, and see how I can do. So I went into business, and one one thing led to another, and pretty soon I was uh, I was doing what I thought was real well. Yeah, and uh, we did the uh, site work. For Pullman Square. Oh, very nice. Back when it was the Super Block, or known as the Super Block. Super Block, yeah. yeah. I've got um, all the uh, big brick pavers. Um, somebody with the city told me it's in your contract. You've got to haul them off. And I said, Well, <laughs> if it's in my contract, I'll haul them off. And I took them out to my property and dumped them. They apparently didn't know what they were worth. If you Google them and and uh, I think they're worth about three dollars a piece now. Those old old bricks, you know. Yeah. Uh, but we've I, I've been I thoroughly enjoyed it, and I didn't I stayed completely away from football. I never I wouldn't watch a game on TV. I never went around the Marshall program um, until Jim Donnan reached out to me and um, kept calling me. He had coached at Florida State University where my younger brother, who's six years younger than me, had played football. And um, apparently Jim had called my brother and got my number, called me, and I said, I, to I thanked him. And I said, well, this, that's very nice, but I, you know, I'm doing pretty good without football. Um, and then um, I just, I didn't. I didn't want to get back in the stadium, mm -hmm. and and you know, everybody knows now that uh, I'm at every football game. Usually, I'm tailgating, <laughs> but I will go in there. But I, I still am uh, uh, uncomfortable mm -hmm. uh, in there. Everybody at Marshall has made me feel very, very comfortable. Everybody. Uh, 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 and I, I can't tell them how much I appreciate it. It's just, uh, and I have told them. Mm -hmm. I've told Doc Holliday. I've told uh, Mike, the athletic director, Hamrick. Uh, even um, uh, the new president. God dang, I can't remember names very good. I'm oh. 73 years old, so I got a. <laughs> And I've had a couple of hits to the head. So I'm, <laughs> what's his last name? Jerry Gilbert. Yeah, yeah thanks, Gilbert. Yeah. Yeah. I hope uh, that he's he's. I invited him to come out and uh, see me sometime. He said his wife's not coming, moving up until June. And I said, well, if you get a chance, come on out to the house. I'm looking forward to talking with him. So that's great. Marshall has been nice to me. Yeah. Um, Marshall is is a university to uh, be very proud of. I think it's uh, it's a beautiful university. Um, I know the the uh, downfall of coal is 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 putting a pinch on not only Marshall but the whole state. Mm -hmm. And I know we're going to have to cut back a little bit. That's but we're going to have probably get more donations. Right. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, Absolutely. You talked to uh, in the in your book read about how you know reestablishing that relationship with Marshall um, has helped you through the healing process. You know, after all this time, and, and you talk about uh, you know the, the the nightmares that you would have after you know in between times mm -hmm. after the crash, moving up until and, until then. Yeah. Um, and, and when you is that something you feel like you, you, you'll a part of you will, will you'll always have some of that. Uh, as time goes on, some of that anxiety and, and, and that I, kind of thing. I don't, I don't think so. It's been so long now; I've forgotten. You know, um, 
sometimes uh, it's good to forget things. You know what I'm saying? Uh, but it's, um, it's it, it, it never was uh, an easy thing to deal with in the stadium part of yeah. watching the program. You talked about uh, Jack Lingle uh, a, a, little, a little bit ago, and he was the, the, the coach that came in. Uh, you talk about Dick Bestwick, who uh, came up from Georgia. Uh, yeah. He stayed two or three days. Yeah. Uh, you thought you were going to go and, and meet him uh, the, uh, uh, the next morning for a, a strategy session, and next yeah. thing you know, you hear on the radio that Dick Bestwick is, is not yeah. coming, and, and, and you Jack know what, Lingle comes in. Do you know what that administrator did? Accused me of running him off. Mm. And yeah. I know Dick best. He's, uh, he's a lot older than I am, and he's not in good health now, but he lives in Athens, Georgia, and I go down there quite a bit. But I went up to Dick Bestwick at a, a Georgia basketball game and introduced myself, and we got to hugging and tears in our eyes, and um, I asked him. He said, no, had nothing to do with it with you yeah. and if you read the book a little closer uh, my ghostwriter talked to two other former head coaches of Marshall and they did all of my gunslinging for me exactly they they, they told similar stories didn't they yeah something about this administrator set the um, football program back 20 years and both of them said it I did. I never said anything like that, you know. Yeah. I did not in that book. Mm -hmm. um, but here they are, saying, "I know I've got some questions that I'd love to ask some people. They're all dead now. I mean, what good's it gonna do? I'm not gonna. I've been holding a grudge half my life, you know. Yeah. Sure. And I'm getting over it now. And I want to get over it. I want to be. Uh, I want to go around with a smile on my face, and I want to be happy. I want to make other people happy. Absolutely. I'd like to, whatever I've got to offer, uh, I, Doc knows it, and uh, Mike Hamrick knows it, whatever, whatever I've got to offer, uh, Marshall, I will gladly donate it, whatever. And I've got paper after paper at my house on Marshall University, because uh, Patrick Garbin, the ghostwriter, mm -hmm. Gave it all back to me when I was down there this last time, and it, it filled up my car, the suburban car. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and I love what you wrote about the relationship that you had with Patrick because you said in, you say in your book that you'd been approached several times before about doing a book, and then finally Patrick comes up and talks to you, and, and you told him something I thought was great, which is, uh, yes, we'll do this book, but it's got to be straight. And it, no BS. That's right. And no BS. That, and, I, and I think that, anybody that reads this book knows it, it, you tell it just as, as you remember exactly. it and just as it happened. Now, let me, let me tell you a strange thing. I, uh, I told Patrick Garbin that 1971 season was my last year of coaching. And he had been reading and uh, Googling. You got on the computer. I don't know how to do all that real good, but he knows – and he asked me, he said, I thought you coached a 72 season. I said, no, I did not. I coached 71, and, and then I quit. And he said, he told me later, he said, I just let that go. I knew that wasn't the truth. Because <laughs> I knew that I had pictures of you that were in the newspaper, and the, the date was on the newspaper that you gave me. And he says, there are too many other things that, that showed that you did coach. Well, by God, he proved it to me. I don't remember one thing about the 72 season. It's gone. Yeah. And um, if, if I didn't get, if I didn't make anybody happy by writing this book, I made myself happy because if you read some of the things some of those people say about me, um, it, it, was very impressive to me. It just, it, it almost made a tear come to my eyes. Mm -hmm. It's just, uh, and they're nice people. Yeah. Uh, Bobby Bowden um, is one of the best people I've ever met in my life. Yeah. Straight as an arrow. Mm -hmm. uh, 
Um, but a great guy. Loves to play golf. We used to play golf together all the time. Uh, we're both too old to play now. <laughs> Bill Peterson was a great guy. Fred Belitnikov. If you read what Fred wrote in there, it's just, it's, it really is, it's, it's, it makes me feel very good that they felt that way about me. Uh, no. Do you and Jack Lingle still keep in contact? Yeah, we, you know, uh, we had our uh, fusses when I was coaching under him. And uh, and then we've had a couple other things that uh, that bothered me. I had to talk to him about. But we've got it's everything straight now. We're in good shape now. Yep. Because a lot of people forget that you know he won nine games, I believe, in four or five years here at, yeah. at Marshall. But then he went on to have a great career, and you, and you compliment him in, in athletics. Absolutely. Hey, apparently, I mean just to uh, stay at the Naval Academy that long and some of the other places he was athletic director. Yes, sir. I, I respect that. I give him honor to that. He's a good guy. There were just, I don't know, it's like I, and I also said, hell, I was probably jealous of him. You know, I, that's probably what it all amounted to. Um, that's why we probably didn't get along too good. Mm -hmm. So, Red, um, as, as we finish up here, if uh, anyone wants to get a, a copy of your book, uh, A Coach in Progress, Martial Football, A Story of Survival and Revival, if they want to get in contact with you, if someone watching wants to talk to you about uh, book signings or maybe mm -hmm. to come speak to their high school team or their college team or, or whatever it may be, how can they, where can they get your book, first of all, and how can they get in contact with you? I'm not sure where they can get the book. They can call me. I've got... Uh, I think, I'm not sure how many books I've got, but we've got to take those. We're going up this weekend to Dover, Ohio, for a library, and uh, we're going to have some books to sell up there. But uh, I don't know. Uh, Amazon, I think, has got books now. And I think the Marshall um, Student Center still has some. Uh, um, and anybody... Uh, can find my telephone number, and if they want me to sign it, I'll be more than happy to. That's great. It, it is a fantastic book uh, about what happened before, during, and after uh, the November 14, 1970 Marshall plane crash. Red Dawson, the author, along with Patrick Garbin, a coach in progress, Marshall football, a story of survival and revival. Thanks so much for coming on to the show today and talking to us about this great book, and, uh, and uh, we look forward to uh, following you as, as you continue to... Uh, uh, to, to write more and speak more, and we appreciate you coming in. Well, I might speak a little bit on occasion, but what I really enjoy now is feeding the deer <laughs> and feeding the birds <laughs> and uh, maybe having a cold one. Absolutely. Because I know when we talked on the phone, when we were talking yeah. about scheduling this interview, you said, yeah. well, you know, I'm retired. I don't have a schedule anymore. So, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. so, so congratulations. I'm, I really am enjoying life. I did, I don't know what came apart in my knee, but... Um, it'll it'll get better, but I I walk a lot out out on my property and um, and you know really and truly blackberry season is just around the corner. That's true. And I lo we love to pick blackberries out. Oh, That's yeah. a heaven. Oh yeah, absolutely. You know, so I'm enjoying life. That's great. That's mm -hmm. great. And th thank you so much. And thank you. Thank you for your book. It was a pleasure. Pleasure thank meeting you. you and talking with thank you. Thank you for having me. And we want to take a moment to say thanks to Charlotte McCoy and her staff at Empire Books and News for providing our studio taping space today. We encourage you to come down and check out Empire Books and News, pick up a copy of uh, Red Dawson's book, as well as other authors, publishers, and editors, works that we've had featured here on the program that's available for you right here at Empire Books and News. If you've got a question, comment, or suggestion about this chapter's program or any chapter's program you've seen here on Armstrong Television, we'd like to hear from you. The email address is right here at the bottom of the screen, lp4 at zoominternet.net. And we've also made it possible for you to go back and watch old episodes of Chapters through YouTube and the Armstrong One Wire page on YouTube. That address is also here at the bottom of the screen. When you type in that address, just click on the Chapters tab and you can find over uh, 
eight hours of author, publisher, and editor interviews right there uh, on the Armstrong One Wire page on YouTube. And we encourage you to come down to Empire Books and News on the third Monday of each month for the monthly Writers Can Read open mic event. If you're a writer who has something published or you're working on something in progress and you'd like to get a feed, some feedback from an audience, Empire Books and News is the place to be each uh, third Monday of each month, 7 to 8.30 right here at Empire Books and News. Uh, Red's going to be one of our uh, upcoming readers. We look forward to that. And so we encourage you to stop by uh, the third Monday of each month right here at Empire Books and News for the Writers Can Read open mic event. And that's going to do it for us this time on Chapters. Please come again next time. And in the meantime, stay tuned to this station for news and views that impact you and your community. <laughs>